open the pod bay doors, though. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56 degrees. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks, Mark, and the organizer for inviting me. It seems like uh, this is going to be a great time to watch a comedy, indeed. Um, so uh, I'm a neuroscientist, and uh, in my lab, uh, we're trying to understand how the brain control instinctive behaviors such as parenting, mating, aggression. And uh, obviously, I'm not working on humans. I, um, our model system are mammals, and particularly mice. But I will still try today to um, explain to do how um, attraction works, uh, both in animals and in humans. I'll try to uh, show you what is similar and what is different between animal species and humans. So you can see here some very beautiful um, uh, mating pairs. And one can argue that the really important goal in life is to uh, identify, attract, attract, and for some species, keep a mating partner for a long time. And so how does the brain do that? Well, it's important to realize that um, the brain only receives signals that are obtained by very specialized sensory organs uh, that uh, uh, identify photons for vision or uh, mechanical uh, stimuli such as touch, chemical stimuli such as taste or smell or sound like hearing. So the brain is entirely relying on uh, these sensory organs. And once these stimuli are detected, by the sensory organs, they are translated into what the brain understands, which are action potentials. So uh, propagation of electrical stimuli that help the brain encode these signals and in turn engage in specific behaviors. And what I would like to tell you today are these two parts of the science of attraction. One is how do we identify um, the right partner and then how are behaviors triggered or regulated within the brain. So what is very important to understand when we talk about the neurobiology of instinctive behavior is that uh, these two steps, the identification and then um, the processing of particular stimuli, obey different rules. So if you think about, uh, if, you, if you look at what are the signals that animals detect or that humans detect, they are clearly extremely different from each other. So each species really rely on a very um, particular set of cues. So for example, you see these birds completely on the left. These are American flickers, and the way um, a female identifies a male is thanks to the little black spot that you can see on the, on the face of the male, uh, this little uh, moustache that you can see here. Now, if you paint a moustache on the face of this female, then the other males, instead of mating with that female, will attack it because they think it's a, it's a male. And similarly, if you mask the moustache on the face of that male, then the other males are going to attempt to mate with it because they think it's a female. So I have a moustache, I'm a male. I don't have a moustache, I'm not a male. So other species, such as rodents, rely on chemical cues that are called pheromones. And I will talk a little bit more about pheromones uh, in, in the next few slides. And then humans, are they are very different. It's very clear. Uh, we'll talk about pheromones in humans, but they mainly rely on visual and auditory cues. So again, these signals um, that are involved in attraction are really very different from one species to the other. But neuroscientists believe that the neuronal circuit, the parts of the brain and the mechanism in the brain that process these signals and that trigger behavior are likely to be very similar from each other. They might not be identical, but they are uh, fundamentally very similar. 
Okay, so what about the pheromones? Well, pheromones are chemical signals that are exchanged within an animal species and provide a lot of information from one individual to the other. They were originally identified in insects, more uh, particularly uh, ants, uh, and they are highly studied also uh, in rodents, and in my lab we are using mice. They are used for recognition in general of one animal to the other. Uh, they uh, signal kinship, uh, the sex or the gender of the animal, the existence of social groups, particularly in insects. Uh, in, in ants, they are also involved in recruitment, for example, to uh, a source of food or to a nest. Um, they are involved in alarm and defense, and that's true both for insects and uh, species uh, of fish, for example. And then they are highly involved in sexual communication. Where are pheromones? Where are they found? Well, um, they are mainly secreted in all sorts of bodily secretions, such as sweat, tears, uh, and, and other type of uh, secretion. And uh, you will see in the movie one of the actors um, <laughs> taking two very big sniffs of two different sources of pheromones. Now, whether <laughs> that does anything to him or not, um, We'll, we'll see uh, in, in the next few slides. So these are animals that are typically try to identify pheromones, mammals. You can see they have this very uh, special uh, facial green. They retract their lips. And what they are trying to do here is to capture the scents of other animals of their species, usually of a, uh, an animal of a, a, the opposite sex. And what they are trying to do by doing this is to have the pheromones access a particular set of olfactory neurons that are located in this structure here called the vomonasal organ. Now, it took me almost a year to be able to pronounce that word. So, <laughs> You can use the acronym, which is VNO, for vermin nasal organ, the VNO. So these animals are all trying to detect pheromones in their VNO, and once these neurons are excited, they send their signals through a particular pathway in the brain. And what is very special about this neuronal pathway is that it totally bypasses the cortex. It totally bypasses cognitive areas. In other words, <laughs> if you think about Consciousness in animals, these animals are just not conscious of uh, the detection of pheromones. Now, these set of olfactory neurons are contrast to another set of olfactory neurons, the ones that are located in what is called the main olfactory epithelium. So that's in the recess of the nose, in the nasal cavity, right here in the back of the nose. And these neurons detect volatile odorants when the animal is breathing. And these signals here are sent to a very different pathway in the brain. And what is interesting about this pathway is that it comprises a lot of cognitive areas, a lot of cortical areas, in contrast to uh, the set of uh, neurons we talked uh, earlier. Now, many years ago, my lab identified a very important gene for the function of the vomonasal organ. And basically, this gene encodes an ion channel called TRIPSI2. It doesn't really matter the, the name. What is important is that in animals that are mutant, in mouse mutants, for their genes, there's absolutely no VNO function. In other words, these animals are completely unable to detect pheromones. And so what is, um, what is their behavior? Well, their behavior is actually very surprising. Not at all what we had expected. We had expected that this animal could simply not mate. But actually, they do mate, but they mate both with males and females. They are completely unable to tell apart a male and a female. In contrast, animals that are mutant for the main olfactory system are unable to mate. And so from these, we can conclude that these two olfactory systems actually work together. Um, the vomonasal uh, system detects the sex of individuals, and the main olfactory system in the mouse, again, is involved in uh, triggering mating behavior. So that's quite intriguing, right? What's happening in humans or in other species of mammals? Because this is true in most mammals, but not all of them. And so what you see here is an evolutionary tree um, 
that show various mammals, various monkeys and apes, and humans are right here. And these little uh, yellow triangles here indicate the position of deleterious mutation in the TRPSI2 genes. And as you can see, uh, these mutations have accumulated in human, and in, in the human genome, there are as many as nine deleterious mutations in the TRPSI2 gene. What does that mean? Well, it means that the TRPSI2 gene or the vorminasal organ are absolutely not functional in humans. And there are reports that humans have a functional vorminasal organ, but this is a very old story, and the people who pretended this had a serious conflict of interest. They had started a company called Aerox that was selling pheromones uh, that you can buy on Amazon and others, so don't buy them. Uh, this is just wrong. And so <laughs> the conclusion here is that there's no functional vorminasal organ in, in human and higher primate. As you can see, this mutation here have accumulated in all these species here. And what is interesting is that the emergence of this mutation actually correspond also to the duplication of the red and the green opsin genes. So these animals here are trichromat. They see color vision unlike these other uh, mammals. And so what it means is that very likely vision has replaced olfaction in all these uh, animal species. So in human, as well as in many of these uh, higher apes, uh, they are more reliant on cognitive cues, on smell, like perfume that you know, we perceive uh, consciously, sight, sound, as well as internal representation. So that's also something special about the human brain. The human brain is among the very few brains in animals that is able to escape the diktat of sensory systems. So it's able to, do, to have its own representation to drive behavior. Okay, so now let me t go into the inside of the brain. Um, and I would like to briefly mention two really important small proteins, or called peptides, oxytocin and vasopressin, uh, that some people think are the peptides, the internal peptides of love. These are very, very small peptides. They have nine amino acids, so very, very tiny. And what is interesting is that these peptides, as well as their ancestors, are found in many species of animals, from insect, worms, vertebrate, and mammals. And in all these animals, they are involved in the control of social behavior. So it's quite uh, interesting. So there's something very fascinating about uh, oxytocin and vasopressin, and oxytocin in particular. Um, why have they been presented as the peptides of love? Well, it started by um, one very important uh, love in human, uh, that's parental love. Um, that's, sorry, that is my seat. <laughs> For those interested in the data, I uh, put this graph here. This in pink is uh, the, um, the amount of oxytocin that is found uh, in the blood uh, in a woman before and after pregnancy. And as you can see, during pregnancy, there are a lot of, a lot of hormones that uh, change level, but uh, oxytocin has a peak of secretion right uh, around delivery and then um, during breastfeeding. And so what is happening is that all these hormonal changes here have two roles. They prepare both the body and the brain for parenting. So that's how mom is ready uh, to, to be a mom in animals as well as in humans. And so at birth, oxytocin is essential for delivery, for uterine con contraction, and uh, during breastfeeding, um, oxytocin stimulates uh, milk ejection in response to the infant suckling. And it has been shown in many animal species that oxytocin promotes maternal behavior, and that high level of oxytocin in animals as well as uh, human have been associated with higher maternal bonding in humans. And so this gave a really interesting idea, is that this um, ancestral bond, this initial bond formed between the mother and an infant in animals or in mammals could also be used as a template than for other type of emotional bonds, including uh, uh, love. And so is that true? Well, 
there is a very interesting uh, animal model that enabled to test this idea, and this work uh, has been done by Tom Insel in the 90s. These are rodents called prairie vole and meadow vole, and the difference between the two is that uh, when a male and a female meadow vole mate together, then they stay together for their whole life. And in contrast, when a male made of all and a female made of all mate, they mate, and then that's it, they separate uh, almost immediately. And what is interesting is that in these species here, the male and the female huddle together and they exhibit this long-term uh, pair bonding than this other species of uh, vole does not exhibit. So what you see here is the time huddling uh, with a partner in, in brown and with a stranger in, in light brown, and you see the huddling uh, with a, a partner is very high in prairie vole and very low in meadow vole. So this one experienced the equivalent of love, if you wish, and those ones do not. And what is quite interesting is that the infusion of vasopressin in the male and oxytocin in the female brain are sufficient to recapitulate that bond. So what you see here uh, in gray are animals that have been infused with just you know, normal liquid, and there's nothing really special uh, when the animal is presented with a partner or a neutral stimulus or a stranger. But you can see if males are infused with this peptide vasopressin, they have a very, very strong preference uh, for their partner compared to a neutral stimulus or a stranger. And oxytocin, in male at least, is the same as the control. And if you do the experiment in female, now it's oxytocin that is a very powerful uh, molecule to generate that bond. So these peptide, therefore, seem to be involved in generating the bond between the mating partners, this uh, animal love, if you wish. And so the question is, why is there a difference between the meadow vol and the prayer vol? And so what you see here are brain section from the prairie vole and from the meadow vole. And what you see in dark are the areas in which oxytocin or vasopressin are binding. And you can see this area here is very dark in prairie vole and very uh, light in meadow vole. It means that oxytocin is able to act in this brain area in prairie vole, but not in meadow vole. And these areas are very interesting. Uh, this one is called the nucleus accumbens. This, this one is called the ventral pallidum. These areas are involved in reward and pleasure. So uh, certainly, animals that uh, can have the effect of oxytocin in this brain area will find enormous reward and pleasure to stay with their mating partner and therefore stay with them. So all of this is in one species of rodent, the vole, what about humans? Well, there are many reports that uh, indicate that oxytocin may facilitate social interaction and feelings of attachment in humans. So for example, couples that receive intranasal oxytocin, you know, you can't inject in the brain, you just spray in the nose, uh, report uh, significant positive communication, um, eye contact, self-disclosure, positive body language, than uh, couples that are treated with placebo. Uh, in women, uh, oxytocin has been shown to be positively correlated with feelings of attachment. And uh, it seems that when women view pictures of loved ones, they have high brain activity in pathways that, at least in animals, have been shown to contain high level of oxytocin and vasopressin receptor. And similarly for people uh, describing intense, being intensely in love. Similarly, uh, there seem to be increase in trusting um, for people who inhale oxytocin. So these, all of these seem very tantalizing, but the story is a little bit more complicated uh, because even though even uh, there have been some reports that oxytocin might temporarily improve empathy and social communication in people with uh, autistic disorders, when these experiments have been enlarged with more doses and larger cohort, none of this was replicated. And similarly, in some contexts, actually oxytocin seemed to be driving aggression uh, rather than uh, uh, trust and cooperation. So the story is a little bit complicated. 
And in fact, <laughs> there are really no proof that oxytocin uh, is associated with being in love and that high level of oxytocin um, work. And in fact, there are even no proof whatsoever that this intranasal spray of oxytocin really do increase oxytocin in the brain. So you can buy oxytocin spray in Amazon, just don't do it. <laughs> now, the problem is that the pharmacology of oxytocin is very complicated. We still don't know how to measure neither the amount of oxytocin or oxytocin receptor. And then I have a long quote here that is simply here to say that uh, all the studies that have been published are generally underpowered. It means that the statistics of those studies was poor and that um, uh, the remarkable report that intranasal oxytocin influences a large number of human social behaviors should be viewed with healthy, healthy skepticism. Okay, so don't buy that thing on Amazon. <laughs> And in fact, it to such an extent that Tom Insel, the person, the scientist I talked to you before that started all these studies on oxytocin and, and uh, the basis of love, uh, was subsequently the director of the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, and he wrote uh, a letter uh, very clearly stating that the NIMH will no longer support clinical trial with oxytocin until all the issues here are solved. Now, one interesting action of oxytocin, though, is the pet owner bonding. And um, it has been reported that dog owners who have a long duration of gaze and have a high degree of attachment to their dog have higher urinary oxytocin um, and than the one that have short interaction and report lower degree of attachment. And you know, it might not be only dogs, actually. Uh, you'll see a fish called Wanda, and you'll see two individuals that have very different interaction with this fish. And i let you guess who has a higher level of oxytocin. And on this note, uh, enjoy the movie.